I'm really pleased to introduce uh, uh, Neville. Um, he comes to us from uh, the Ministry of Health uh, Malta. Uh, he's director of uh, health information and research at the Ministry for Health and um, is, uh, has been um, co-chairing uh, our events um, from since the start of the pandemic uh, and is a great champion of um, infodemic management and evidence-informed policymaking. Uh, in general, um, um, in in health, uh, Neville, over to you. Thanks, Tina. I think Tina's always a bit too flattering. Um, for me, it's always been uh, an opportunity and an honor, actually, to to be involved in this. Um, I've ended up really uh, sort of managing the infodemic, at least for for my country, um, by chance, really having been in health information for many, many years, as, as uh, Tina knows. Now, for those of you who just did thought that they didn't hear well, like where I come from, like, huh, Malta, where is that? Um, so, you know, this is Europe and North Africa. And you see that tiny little speck, that, that's, not, that's not a pixel gone wrong. Huh? That's actually a couple of islands there. Um, and it's an independent country called Malta. Anyway, it's a pretty small country. Um, it's 35 kilometers from tip to tip. Um, so that's pretty small, um, definitely uh, compared to any of your countries. Nonetheless, this population of half a million people has indeed exported a lot of public health people, particularly the WHO, as my WHO colleagues can confirm. So. Just to give you an idea, um, uh, this is a bit old. This I, I've stolen this, or rather, well, borrowed from Hootsuite, um, but it gives a nice insight um, of our population. As you can see, they have a, the number is way off, underestimated, and indeed, that is one of the challenges we have in this country. Our population is growing very, very fast, mostly through. Uh, migrant workers, um, the economy, at least well pre-COVID, it was doing pretty well. Um, so it's attracting a lot of migrant workers. Literacy rate is fairly high um, uh, and living standard is also fairly high and also penetrance of internet and social media use, which obviously creates uh, some challenges for us as infodemic managers. But back to infodemic management, as, as the director has been saying earlier on, is this a new phenomenon? Well, I've been in health information now for what, 16 years, lost count really. Um, no, it's absolutely not a new phenomenon. It's grown, it's amplified, uh, you know, since COVID has been around, but it's definitely not a new phenomenon. In fact, these, these are all publications I'm showing you here. They date back to 2017 and 18 where the phenomenon was already pretty well known. And uh, without obviously making specific references, in some of these publications, there are allegations that um, social media has managed to elect certain governments in certain countries. And I think you'll probably share that uh, insight with me too. Now, so I've been challenged to come up with seven rules for infodemic management. And I think, I'll, well, I've done my best. So I definitely believe that you need to be where the people are. Okay, so uh, many of us in health have, uh, you know, keep insisting on maintaining a website like my de department, unfortunately, well, we do too. Uh, you know, somewhere hidden in the Ministry of Health website, typically. Nobody access that anymore, you know? I mean, we're a bit stuck in internet 1.0, so to say, in some cases. In reality, most people are getting their information through uh, social media, and that is also linked to news outlets. Now, news outlets obviously are not the main propagator of misinformation, even though we do have some uh, I can think definitely of one strong misinformation channel in Australia and another one in the US right now. Again, I'm not going into names. Now, here in Malta, for example, the most popular social media channel 
is Facebook. Um, I know that uh, in other areas of the world, other uh, social media channels are more popular. WhatsApp is also heavily used uh, here in Malta. It doesn't feature on the slide. Um, and But we don't have, I mean, I do have Telegram, for example, but it's definitely not something that uh, most people use here. So you definitely need to be where the people are. That's for sure. So when choosing your memberships, let's talk maybe, you know, along the lines of a Facebook, uh, which I understand is also one of the most prominent social media groupings. Um, definitely, I would try to use my time as best as I can. So I try to actively follow groups and I try to avoid sector specific groups unless obviously I have a specific intent. Again, the smaller the grouping, the more, the less effective it's going to be to be uh, effective when engaging on, on uh, any particular information. And also it will hinder the inoculation process, which we'll talk about at a later stage. So ideally groups should be at population level with cross-sectional membership, not with a specific aim or agenda. Again, if you have a uh, targeted misinformation group, you know, we're seeing a lot of no to masks group popping up. It's very difficult to put in a word there. So um, that's a bit of a lost cause, I must admit, unless the people in WHO Geneva have found a way how to penetrate that. I must admit I have not yet. Um, so yeah, so basically you definitely have to try to be where most people are, unlike what we're doing for COVID, right? Second, you need to respect one's intelligence and keep calm. Even when you have serious doubts if there is any intelligence in the first place, okay? I mean, use your own everyday life experience. How many times have you convinced anyone by insulting him that he's an idiot uh, or her? You know, I mean, insulting people does not convince anyone. We have to be objective. We have to remain professional and keep calm. And this is not easy. Some of them actively engage in breaking your nerve. Okay, so a lot of, uh, of the very active misinformers actively try to make you, you know, get angry and react from the hip, so to say, to shoot from the hip. You need to resist that as much as possible. Okay. Now you need to be out there and look for new trends. Okay. Um, I know this is, this is going to sound really mean, but we need to catch them when they're still young. Uh, so basically, you know, new rumors need to be addressed early on because obviously then it would be a good opportunity to inoculate. Case in point, last Saturday, uh, was it Saturday or Sunday? I'm losing track of time now, I'm afraid. Um, a local doctor actually published an article in one of the main English newspapers here in Malta. And I could see what happened actually. It was written in very good scientific language. Um, he has written papers before, and uh, I'm sure that he tried to publish this and then having not managed to publish it in an academic journal, he sent it to the local newspaper. So obviously it was very convincing, you know, very scientific sounding. I wanted to be there as quickly as possible. So I actually managed to put in the first comment on that news outlets page. And I think it has helped a lot because from what I have seen, what could have been explosive has only garnered eight comments in total. So you have to be there. And also not just in reacting to posts, you also have to be proactive. Okay, so if you sense certain, uh, certain currents, um, you might have to engage proactively. So again, one of the things I do locally there is a very active local group, uh, including basically doctors from the whole of Molten Gojo. And uh, I try to, as much as possible, share information with this group, again, for the purposes of inoculation, which we'll be discussing later on. 
I know you must be thinking like, what the hell is he talking about inoculation? Well, I'll explain later on. Um, so there you are, okay? Um, this guy, apparently, when I looked him up, Brown Tricky is the first guy who let um, black Americans onto baseball teams in the US. Um, and I think the quote applies to obviously other sectors, including ours. Fourth point, answer the question. Don't waffle around, okay? So many of us who worked with, work with ministries, sometimes uh, we try to work around the question by sort of skirting around it because the answer is too uncomfortable. Um, you might have to grab the bull by the horns and try to state things, you know, as, as they are. Uh, again, that makes you more credible. Huh? If you actually admit that certain things are unsure, okay, it makes, more, it makes you more credible. You, know, you need to answer the question. And I think here um, we need to talk about policymakers as well whilst we're here. I know the, 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 also the, uh, the, the instructions have been given uh, for this session is to address also the concerns of policymakers. So policymakers are also subject to misinformation, huh? very much so. Many policymakers are not technical health people. They get pressures from all sides. They have to listen to everyone, okay? Unfortunately, health information or the right health information, and in this, you know, I, I sort of beat my chest and say mea culpa as representative of the sector as well. Um, health information is not that visible sometimes or most of the time. So most policymakers really would like to have good information uh, to take health decisions. And then in many cases, because um, there's lots of forces trying to instill uh, problems, sometimes us as well as health information producers actually fuel this by saying, ah, oh, we might have a bias here. We might have missed 1% of the population. Or, you know, we have this little problem here in capturing data. So in, in, in amplifying these, these uh, limitations, as we have been trained scientifically, sometimes that backfires, especially with the politicians, because they tend to see the negative side and forget all the positive side, a bit like how social media works, really. Okay, so yeah, that's the kind of statements that I get usually when I talk to policymakers during health information system assessments, which I have been doing uh, quite a few for uh, WHO Europe. Um, and typically they just decide to go their own way and set up some sort of new group of experts who have no idea of health, but you know, they ask them to build up a strategy. Again, remember politicians need the support to survive, um, as the graphic suggests. So for them, pressures from different sectors is very, very palpable. Another point, limit yourself to the evidence, okay? Whatever the crowd is baying, you have to detach yourself and look for the concrete evidence. And most of the time, you have to look hard for it, okay? Because it's not out there necessarily in the newspapers. But trust me, it is there, okay? Within our countries, in all of our countries, uh, developing and developed, there's always some health information. There's always official information you can refer to. Other reliable sources, of course, include WHO sources itself. This is the European Health Information Gateway from Tina's previous life in, in the European region. Um, it's the product of her hard work as well, and Tim. Um, this has become my friend, I must admit. I've been using it a lot, you know, every day, searching up new things. Uh, it's quick and rough, but it typically gets you to the right place quite quickly. Um, even using WHO, the network of WHO. I must admit earlier on in the epidemic when international organizations had not engaged yet with evidence and I had to inform my colleagues to take decisions and take them fast, you know, I basically went to my friends in WHO and told them, listen, I need to talk to someone in China. I need to talk to someone in Korea. 
and I must admit, I found lots of help there. Okay, so the networking that WHO provides us with is priceless in getting access to the right information. Case in point, some of you might have heard about the alleged deaths following flu vaccinations in Korea. Um, again, I searched and searched and searched. I got access to somebody in Korea and uh, I realized that Korea, the Korean Disease and Control Agency has been sharing lots of information on the investigation of these deaths, unfortunately in Korean. Um, but then again, once I found it, I translated it, you know, machine translation, nothing fancy. And I could start sharing that with my colleagues here at the ministry. So peer review or the lack thereof is not making our life easy. So I can understand why journals are pushing with preprints. Um, you know, we're getting the evidence, we're getting it fast. On the other hand, we're paying a price. So it's like we've increased our sensitivity, but we lost a bit on the specificity. We have to be careful and appraise what we're reading, okay? Not everything that is on the internet, not everything that is in a journal is necessarily, you know, don't forget the rules you've learned in medical school or, or wherever you've been trained, you know? You always have to critically appraise. Okay, we also have had the challenges of changing evidence. You know, COVID is a new challenge for everyone. Um, international organizations like us have been struggling to get the best evidence possible. And we have had change, you know, change of heart in, on a number of issues by um, international and local disease control agencies. Case in point here, ECDC in April 2020, based on the evidence it had at the time, um, it was sort of not really advising face masks uh, outside of healthcare settings. And now October, 2020, you can see, you know, that the, the, the stance has definitely shifted. And if we look at what IHME published very, very recently, it appears that they estimate that it, universal mask use could actually reduce COVID-19 transmission by 40%. Um, so there we are, we have this shifting evidence and misinformers use this against us. Okay, so again, we have to be honest when sharing information. Based on information available in April, this was the case. Now it's changed. Sometimes misinformers share legitimate um, uh, data source, you know, um, um, uh, papers and, and, and uh, articles from journals, but it's amazing, you know, a paper now from March or April is so outdated. I mean, when, when did we face such a time that papers a few months old, uh, you know, became obsolete? And that's the situation we are, we are in, okay? And what hurts most is obviously what is being shared by fellow medical professionals. Um, like, I'm sure you've seen this, the Great Barrington Declaration. I don't want to, you know, to, to uh, imply that I have anything against the three scientists that have been involved in the declaration. They have a right to a scientific opinion and discussion. Unfortunately, um, uh, as I'm not sure if any one of you was following the World Congress on Public Health last week, um, uh, we have had uh, some people sharing evidence that uh, this declaration is the fruit of heavy uh, backing from several organizations, mostly from the US. Um, again, you know, you've seen doctors coming together in the US and even more strongly in Germany. I mean, if those of you who are um, concerned about QAnon in the States, um, must have not been following much what their branch in Germany has been doing within Europe. It's actually much, much stronger. Okay, focus. Misinformers will try to push you into a tangent. It's funny how this COVID-19 misinformation has actually drawn together a variety of audiences a variety of groupings that have coalesced together. So we've got anti-vax groups coming together with uh, 
with you know white supremacist groups with also you know sort of new age promoters kind of thing and also um unfortunately i must add people have been doing a fine job up till now you know like um vegetarianism or 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 healthy practices these have sort of all been drawn together and coalesced together for some reason um, I like particularly the first picture showing the guy with the vendetta mask, the anonymous mask. It's funny how masks, you know, up till a couple of years back were considered as a symbol of freedom. And now it's, they're considered as a symbol of oppression. So focus. Misinformers will try to, when, when the argument is being lost, will A, try to make you angry. And if that is, doesn't work out, we'll try to uh, push you in a tangent, okay? Or pick on a minor issue. So you just have to share the right information and you know, don't push it. Don't go into other areas because otherwise um, that would be an opportunity to deviate the message, okay? And again, be careful. However provocative the person you are addressing might be, you need to focus on the situation or the issue, not the person, okay? It is very tempting to look up your interlocutor online and find what he has done in the past, you know, what has been his agenda in the past. It helps you to understand the person, but be careful. You need to focus on the situation and remain evidence-based. Again, this is also about being first, really, but you need to be able to adapt, all right? Like everybody else, you need to be on top of even the guidances that are being updated, you know, from the international organizations. Um, up till a few months ago, we used to say antigen tests are not, uh, rapid antigen tests are not reliable, but they've been making progress and we're seeing new evidence coming out now. So you need to be on top of the issues okay so on top of your evidence and on top of the currents that are brewing um, uh, on the internet and in in uh, social media so i think the word here is resilience and i'm sharing here one of the bookmarks that was produced by uh, the venice office um, a year or two back if, I, if i'm not mistaken okay so we definitely need to be, remain ahead of the game all the time Okay, there's no waiting in this game. Time is of essence. And lastly, to inoculate. I've been promising you to get here. This is my haiku, by the way, that has been kindly uh, transformed into a graphic by, by, by Tina and her team. Okay, so I think these three points are imperative in managing infodemic. All right. Um, Firstly, never raise your voice, keep civil, explain with evidence, all right, not your personal opinion, with evidence, why it's illogical. And trust me, when you do that, you will, and if you do it in the right places, that will lead into um, inoculation. Now, what do I mean by the term inoculate here? You remember I mentioned the doctors group earlier on? The reason I share information with them is for them to actually copy paste, you know, chop bits and pieces of what I'm sharing there and sharing it with their own followers, with their own patients. Um, I've also noticed, but then again, I come from a small community. I've also noticed that over time, I sort of gained some standing within the groups I was following. So I could see even, you know, relatively, I mean, non-medical, but clearly relatively intelligent people in the community replicating what I was saying. Um, so they were actually doing my work, so to say, and that was nice to see the right information spread as well, you know, on its own accord rather than just misinformation. So I think in a nutshell, I don't want to, I don't want to keep you too long and I'd like to leave some time also for discussion um, I know it will frustrate you, will feel very frustrated seeing certain 
uh, posts, um, certain engagement, people's reluctance to understand, but don't give up, okay? Keep inoculating that good information. I've realized that when there's a post which is completely off and the person is the, who posted it is clearly not going to be convinced by what you're saying, still being there early kills the effect of that post, okay? Because your comment will be high up just underneath the post itself and a lot of people read through comments, okay? So that's very helpful. And if you argue your argument nicely in the comments of that post, it usually decelerates the spread of that post. Um, so it definitely works. So you might not be convincing the guy who posted it, but you might be preventing the spread. And I think this is what we need to focus on here. Uh, most of the time, it won't be possible to, to convert the person, okay? Um, but it would definitely be possible to reduce the spread, restrict the spread. And that's what I focus anyway. Um, this is just, I'm sharing my own experience. I can't say I'm a perfect infodemic manager. In a way, I'm an amateur. It's something that I've learned over the years, especially over the last few months. Um, and I'm just sharing experiences with you on what has worked with me or for me. Anyway, so thanks for the opportunity. Um, I'll stop here and uh, I'll be more than willing to tackle any questions. I'm not sure if anyone is keeping track of them. Yes, uh, Neville, thank you. This is Tina. Um, we are looking at the Slido and we have uh, three questions for you. Um, let's see if we can take them. We don't um, for sure. uh, maybe in like 10 minutes or so. Uh, I know that you're also sure. very busy um, on this. So the first question, um, Neville, uh, on be the first to engage. How do mm -hmm. you differentiate when to respond and when to ignore without losing the opportunity to respond early enough? So I think um, ignoring, I only ignore um, the consequent responses. So when I feel, so I, I like to engage as early as possible, okay? Um, to be honest with you, the, more, the better worded a post, the better to engage on. So sometimes, you know, you find a post full of spelling mistakes, incoherent English, that's not really going to get a lot of traction, will it? But then when you see a post which looks well-worded, well-marketed, that's definitely merits your attention. Now, when then you start engaging with your arguments and you feel you've presented it logically, sometimes you also see other people engaging on your side of the argument, then you can say that you can probably stop engaging. You can, you know, if you've addressed the issue, um, you can just stop engaging despite the misinformer trying to have the last word in, so to say. Um, because as I said, it's ultimately about restricting spread, not so much about convincing the, the guy who has, or, or, or girl for that matter, who has posted that misinformation post. Mm -hmm. You had more questions, I understand. Uh, yes, sorry, I was on mute. <laughs> it's okay, it's okay. Um, so uh, here's a second question. Uh, in some countries, uh, they have laws where they arrest people who spread, uh, who spread uh, false information. What's the policy around um, this infodemic in Malta? So definitely not doing that. Um, I find that doing that typically encourages misinformation rather than prevents it. So the focus should definitely be on inoculating the right information. Okay, remember that the wrong information spreads faster. Um, it's not just because of the algorithms of social media, it's also because of human nature. The spicy, you know, spreads quicker than the boring, so to say. So it's important to inoculate the right information rather than ban. Now, to be honest with you, um, I must admit, I have tried to ban some in some cases, uh, but it was primarily 
where it was a select uh, group, for example, right now we've introduced universal mask use, mandatory universal mask use in Malta, and it has had a re decent effect on our reproductive factor actually as well. Um, we're seeing groupings now rallying together to organize uh, basically, you know, civil disobedience campaigns. Um, we're also aware that not everybody is capable of critically appraising what they're reading, especially the elderly. And this is what scares us, okay? We have a lot of elderly. I didn't show you how much our elderly are actually engaged on social media, but basically uh, Hootsuite estimates that 74% of our elderly is actually online, as opposed to 34% of most other European countries. So, and, and they, 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 unfortunately, they still believe that what appears on social media is the truth, uh, despite, you know, ignoring the source, regardless of the source. So, but then again, as a general principle, banning uh, or, or prosecuting should be limited as much as possible as a last resort. I mean, case in point, there's this gentleman, a doctor from Germany, um, uh, Dr. Heiko Schoening, He's been glorified, sanctified after his arrest in London. You know, I mean, misinformers have actually hugely capitalized on that. So we have to be careful how much to use prohibition as a tool. We should really leave it as a last resort. Inoculation is the best way to go. Yes, and um, actually uh, later on in the course, we also will discuss, you know, how do you evaluate potential um, policy options also for unintended harms, uh, which, you know, basically, Neville, what you're describing is unintended harms that later down the road actually can have the opposite yes. effects of what you're trying to achieve. Um, maybe, maybe one last question. Um, uh, it's hard to limit ourselves to the evidence when the evidence is still evolving. So how do you Indeed. approach this? Um, you have to have some good sense. Um, if the evidence is still evolving, you have to just say it. Okay, so uh, as I said earlier, you have to be as honest as possible. This is not a marketing exercise, this is an information exercise. So if the evidence is still coming in, you must say, you know, there, does, there isn't strong evidence in, in favor of this or against this. Okay, so uh, I think if someone is trying to push an agenda, which is not clear yet, but you really don't have the evidence to combat it, you need to state it up front that, you know, the evidence might not be strong. As a result, we're doing this as a precaution. Let's be fair. In public health, we've taken a lot of precautions, um, this, this pandemic, even the way we address the first wave which uh, at least for most countries, apart from those heavily affected, you know, like Italy, Spain, um, China in the beginning, uh, many other countries have had a better first wave than the second wave. I mean, what we're seeing in Europe is, is uh, mind blowing, okay, in terms of spread right now. And this definitely wasn't as strong in the first wave. Yet the actions we took back then were stronger. Okay, again, so in public health, we do this a lot, all right? When the lack of evidence, we, do, we take precautions. And I think this is a natural principle. And if you, if you share this with your readers, you have to be honest. There isn't enough evidence to say in favor or against, so we're doing this as a precaution. Honesty is best policy. Yes, and I think you actually made a really good point that this is really not a marketing or a communications exercise per se. It's, it's really, you know, an information exercise, which means that your objectives are not only just getting information out there, but, you know, you think about how you get it out there and what the ultimate effect of it is. Yeah. Indeed. Uh, indeed. Yeah. Um, can we have one last question or really quickly? Sure. <laughs> um, sure. What are the implication, implications of fighting misinformation with evidence when you're facing a decline uh, in people's belief in experts? I just, I think you can't give up. You really can't give up. Um, uh, and again, be careful. 
what you read on social media does not necessarily reflect 100% of what on what you are getting in society. Social media amplifies the more vociferous people. Okay, so as I said, we've got a lot of elderly online, but they don't post that much. We've got a lot of elderly not online, of course. So um, as a general rule, you might get most of the time ra a rather biased picture of the of public opinion just by reflecting on social media only. Okay, so when I said horizon scanning earlier, you need to keep your ears pricked, not only on social media, but also to other mainstream media and public opinion around you. Uh, so that's one thing. Don't give up and don't assume that social media is, uh, is a correct reflection, a representative reflection of the real world. Um, it's likely not to be. Uh, we have other things in public health, right? That it seems that we're losing the battle, but we keep insisting. Okay, so let's take, you know, obesity campaigns or whatever other campaigns. Every life saved is a life saved, ultimately. Um, we can do as much as we can, but we really can't give up, okay? If it goes, if the current goes against us, we have to keep insisting. The, the best approach I find really is to speak logic, all right? So I try to give logical arguments that are understandable to people in relatively easy language. Again, you can't speak Greek to people and expect them to, to, to follow you. You have to use uh, easily understandable language. Um, just be logical in your approach and show also how illogical certain misinformation posts are um, or, 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 or claims, okay? Um, I use fact checkers a lot as well eh, in my posts um, and various ones. Uh, there's the AAFP that has actively engaged in fact checking and uh, Snopes and, and, and factcheck.org. So there's plenty of them too. Anyway, but back to the question uh, Tina raised, uh, how do you deal, you know, how do you deal with, with this growing uh, mistrust in health experts? I think that's one main reason why we need infodemic managers. The mistrust in health experts is because of the selective sharing of what health experts are saying. Okay, we only get sharing of the fringe uh, evidence. We're not getting sharing of mainstream evidence. And this is also part of our job um, to, to correct.